Welcome to Season 3 of the Spotlight Series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. Season 1 was launched to help people through the pandemic by talking to a variety of experts about topics such as psychology, finance and health. Season 2 focused on more work-related issues, including HR, marketing and leadership. Now it is time for Season 3. Season 3 is centred on the IT industry, specifically tech startups. There are also career spotlights where I talk to senior IT people about the secrets to their impressive career journeys. My name is Nicholas Steele, founder of JJP Talent Solutions, an Australian IT recruitment company. For over 20 years, I've helped tech startups and innovative SMEs to attract, recruit and retain technical talent. I hope you enjoy listening. I'm delighted to introduce Mike Seidel. Mike is co-founder of Pivot CX, a company based in Indiana, in the United States, which delivers awesome candidate experiences and saves recruiters time with live human-to-human -human communication. He's also the CTO of Virtual Payment Systems, a payment processing fintech. Mike. Thank you for joining me on season three, episode 13 of the Spotlight series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And talking about recruitment and candidate experiences, which is obviously something that I'm, I'm very close to. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm going stateside as well. Um, so, Mike, tell me a bit more about your background and career history. Okay, so this is actually the sixth company I've started, and so I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur. The first company I started when I was actually about 17 years old, and I did that um, for three or four years. Uh, went to college, got thrown out of college, and ended up <laughs> doing a doing a stint in the U.S. Navy, and. Uh, uh, learned uh, how to focus and concentrate and uh, be responsible, I think. And <laughs> <laughs> then after that, I, I ended up, I started a CRM consulting company, then uh, ended up owning an advertisement and marketing agency. And then 2008 hit, the housing crisis hit, and I closed that down and had an opportunity to go to work with the founder of Monster.com, the big U.S.-based job board. And I was the founder and the original CTO for Monster. We were at this organization called Direct Employers. It was a great experience. Got to learn more about the recruitment industry and about recruitment marketing from some of the people that really had invented the category. When I left there, I left with Direct Employers CTO, a guy named Rick Worley, and we started working on a new problem. Uh, we set out to help solve the, the problem of connecting people to jobs by location. And so our company was called Work Here. It, um, it didn't go really all that well. And, and after five years, uh, we were almost out of business and COVID hit last year. And we had yeah. an opportunity to reinvent our company and we did. And is that when it, as it's become Pivot CX? Well, we started building the product um, called that, that, we called Pivot CX, and then we uh, brought the product to market back in December of last year, and um, it took us all of three months to uh, pass up the revenue we had in 2019 and 2020. So just three months for of being on the market, and we looked at that and go, you know what? Let's just go be Pivot CX all the time. So we rebranded. That's that's incredible, and also I hadn't. I'm in Brisbane um, mm -hmm. and we kind of live in a little bit of a bubble here uh, in terms of the way that COVID's been handled. We've, we're living very normal lives um, in comparison to some other states in Australia and also certainly to the rest of the world. So COVID uh, and the recruitment industry in the US, how's that been faring and how is it now and what can you see the future holding? So when COVID hit, and it's really funny, it's almost been a year uh, exactly. Mm. Um, here, here in Indianapolis, we actually were at the very, very front of the curve. There was a conference in Boston, a biotech conference, 
And a lot of the attendees at that conference were exposed to COVID and brought it home. So I actually got quarantined um, this week last year because I had ridden in an elevator with a guy that went to that conference. So oh, wow. um, it, it really, really moved quickly here. And to the recruitment marketing, recruitment industry and recruitment marketing industries, COVID was kind of a mixed bag. Uh, at first, February of last year, everyone stopped hiring. In fact, we mm-hmm. lost 85% of our business in a two-month period because everybody just started laying everybody off and uh, I'm battening down the hatches for what they thought was going to be, uh, I don't know, the end of the world or something. So uh, it was pretty frightening. I, I live, I'm lucky I live in a state, Indiana, that uh, did not lock itself down. We had about a one-month lockdown where we mm-hmm. shut everything down and everyone stayed home. And then... Um, I think it was April, uh, mid-April of last year that we started getting back to business, but things have never been the same. We have mask mandates where everybody has to wear a mask all the time, social distancing rules. A lot of the restaurants went out of business because they just mm-hmm. couldn't, uh, didn't have customers. Uh, everyone learned how to do business with COVID, but for the staffing and recruiting industries, it's been a mixed bag. Some companies have done really well because they're lucky to have had customers that uh, were in manufacturing or essential industries that had an unlimited demand for people. And then there's a lot of recruiting and staffing agencies that have really struggled because their customers are struggling. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, here we had a lockdown for two months, which wasn't too bad to be honest with you. Um, And similarly, February, well, it was March, really, where it just plummeted. It was like falling off a cliff, the job market, because like you say, everyone was thinking, is this the end of the world? But then it's come back really quickly um, and is the same or possibly stronger than it was the beginning of last year Um, in the IT industry, which is what what I specialize in. But it's quite interesting uh, because a lot of the guests that I have on the podcast are from Brisbane and Queensland. So it's I, it's really interesting getting a different perspective from the other side of the world. But I've gone a little bit off tangent from the questions I was originally going to ask you. But as we were talking, I thought, oh my goodness, that's such an obvious question. Um, so sorry, getting back to Pivot CX and, and recruitment, why, and this is a very leading question, why do you think it's so important to improve human-to-human interaction in the recruiting process? There are three reasons that getting hum- that human-to-human interaction in the process is super important. One is a lot of hiring processes are very slow, and we do a lot of processing. So somebody applies for a job on a job board, right? And then three, four weeks later, a recruiter calls them. Um, there's a huge opportunity to go faster and and to hire the best talent before the competition is even talking. Uh, yeah. So there's there's that. Um, from the candidate experience side of it, we see this time and time again where we have someone apply to a job. And, and the way our, our system works is we hook up to job boards and applicant tracking systems. And when someone applies, that triggers a human-to-human conversation people are so surprised that you're actually talking to them because they're so used to the experience yes. where I apply for a job. And then what, uh, three, four weeks later, I get a vaguely worded letter that says that we're not considering you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know what you mean because when I ring people, they're like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like, it's surely not that incredible to, to make a phone call, but I, I understand people can sometimes hide behind technology. Um, but you need that human to human interaction after the end of the day recruitment is a people business so uh definitely and sorry you you was there, was there another reason you there, said there three is reasons. there's yeah i did say three and the third reason is um and this is really becoming more and more important we see about 13 percent of the candidates that apply for a job have inaccurate information on their profile. And so you have this AI or this applicant tracking software that's going to analyze their profile and then make decisions. And 13% of the time we've given that software bad data. And I'll give you an example. Um, we we do have a customer that's a large trucking company. And sometimes we'll have a driver on their, their resume or their CV. It'll say, um, 
it'll say that their license expires two years ago. And yeah. the ATS would have screened them out. And by talking, you know, the, the human who's talking to them knows they wouldn't have applied for the job if they didn't think they were qualified. Let's find out what's wrong here because it looks like that's inaccurate. And so we end up recovering quite a few candidates just by talking to them before uh, before we get too deep into the screening process. So it's really important. And from the candidate side, um, nobody talks to candidates quickly. They, they make them wait. It's really, really exceptional. Like you said, when you ring somebody right away, they're surprised every time. Absolutely. And treat them with an element of respect and kindness, which seems fairly obvious as well. But um, it's funny how but it's not funny. It's it's terrible how many uh, recruiters forget that. Um, so Pivot CX, tell me a little bit more about the company uh, and, and what's what it actually solves. Sure. So what we originally set out to solve was this geography problem. And what we ended up solving, and, and we ended up solving this because we started doing kind of a mini RPO chat with for clients to make our other software work better. Well, it turned out the chat was so good that, that that's what people were really interested in. But what we started doing is every time someone applied, we would just simply text them and start talking to them. And we would try to, We would, at first we really didn't know what we were doing. And then we've kind of figured out, well, wait a minute, what we need to do is introduce the process. What's this hiring process going to be like? Answer questions that the candidate had about the job or the employer, and then confirm that the, uh, the candidate had a- submitted accurate information and really ended up being good enough that we would screen out 80, 90 percent of the applicants and get, our, get the recruiters to where they were able to focus on the 10 15% of the candidates that were high quality candidates, highly engaged, most importantly, completely qualified. And what we found is we were able to get candidates through that process in a matter in sometimes minutes in other times when people were a little slow on the draw on their phone, it might take us a day or two, but by making that whole screening step go so quickly and having people able to talk to a candidate, uh, having uh, be able to talk to a person, the candidate felt better about what was going on. They knew what to expect in the hiring process. They knew where they stood. And and we even uh, would tell candidates uh, when they didn't get to go to the next step. And um, we do this little thing at the end of every conversation where we ask the candidate to rate their experience. Even when we were telling people, no, you're not qualified and we can't, you can't get an interview, um, they would still give us a five-star rating and say, thank you for telling me no. Exactly. And it's not a case of no news is good news. It's like no news is no news. You're left in the dark. So at least you know, right, I can tick that off my list and focus on the other roles that I've applied for, for example. See, exactly. I mean, it makes it's common sense, but candidates do get tend to tend to be left to get left in the dark, which is when I've been on that side of the fence, it's really, really frustrating, disheartening. So chatbots, chatbots versus humans. How do you think artificial intelligence differs from actual intelligence? Well, um, so when we went to build our our chat product, our first try at this, actually, we, we started doing chat and then we go, okay, let's, since AI and chatbots were really hot two years ago, we go, okay, let's write a chatbot. And so we actually spent a half million dollars built a prototype chatbot and realized it just wasn't very good at talking, carrying on a conversation with someone. And it was really easy to tell you were talking to a bot. Mm. And so what would happen is, and and I'll never forget this because I was sitting uh, with the engineering team and we were looking, we were watching chats in real time and we had a, a lady apply for a job. And she, first thing she said was my mom has cancer and I really need to get a job. Can you help? And the chat bot replied very quickly. All right. Woohoo. Let's go. What is your name? (sighs) Oh my goodness. And then we started really looking at the chat bots behavior very critically. And what we realized was chat bot was really good at asking yes, no questions. It was really good at what school did you graduate from? But Mm -hmm. the minute that the candidate went off script, 
and, and candidates, they, they don't stick to the script very well, do they? No. <laughs> um, so, so the candidate would go off script and the chat bot would be clueless. And then it would do what every good computer program does. Uh, whatever the programmer told it to do next, that's what it would do. And it just led to some very tone deaf conversations that had no empathy. And um, people really didn't like that experience. So one day, um, I'll never forget it because I was actually at a fundraising conference where we were in a big pitch competition. And I get a call from the office going, can we try an experiment and put the interns versus the chat bot and see who does better? And so we pitted three interns versus the chat bot to see who could turn more applies into interviews. And the interns beat the chat bot by a factor of three. Oh, wow. Because of empathy? And it was, yeah, it was empathy. Yeah. It was being able to realize that the job seeker, the candidate was being, uh, was, was telling a joke. It was yeah. being able to realize, um, kind of the tone in the message. Somebody, you know, had a concern and, and they were able to ask, Oh, what are you worried about? And, and get answers. Mm-hmm. And we looked at that and, and realized, you know, it's not really all that expensive to have a chat conversation with someone. Um, it, it's not like a phone call where if I talk to you for 20 minutes, I just spent 20 minutes on it. If I'm doing this with chat in 20 minutes, I might close three or four conversations, maybe five. And so we realized this is pretty economical to let a live human chat with a live human every time. And the other thing that's be- beautiful about it is you can change the process quickly. Uh, the bots, have to be reprogrammed sometimes. When you want to change the questions they ask, you have to retrain the bot. That takes time. That takes software developers. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, if we have a customer change a requirement with humans, you simply uh, send a message to all the humans and say, question three is now, you know, is now this instead of that. And from that moment forward, everybody asks the right question. So the humans are a lot more trainable than the bot is. The thing that where the artificial intelligence has a tremendous advantage is they're very inexpensive and they're very good at yes, no questions. But, um, you know, back to experience, people can tell it's not human. They don't like it. We we uh, did a little poll. We found 73 percent of the respondents would uh, don't they just don't want to talk to your chat bot. Yeah, because they don't have that human experience um, to, yeah. to empathize and understand persuade sometimes as well so yeah definitely I think we've yeah we've spoken about the the difference between humans and chatbots and I really like the fact that you've got humans behind that because I'm all about the people and bringing some humanity into recruitment (laughs) which which sometimes does disappear because of hiding behind the technology so when you personally are recruiting new team members what do you consider to be three crucial characteristics to becoming a high performer? At our company, we actually look for people that are very comfortable. Uh, you'll never guess doing chat. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm probably a woman then. It's like oh, I'm always well. nattering away. So. Yeah. So we look at people. We look for people that that really like to to talk and talk through through. Um, you know, through a little chat window on their computer, or they're always doing this with their phone, or they're always, you know, got their phone out and and tapping away, right? Um, So uh, we're pretty big on that. But what we really look for are two things. We look for ability to learn. We like to hire people that uh, are are able to learn quickly and love learning. Because Mm -hmm. to be honest with you, um, what we're doing here is new and different. Nobody's done it before. So all the, you know, I, I may have been around for a long time, but what I know doesn't always apply to this business. And so our ability to learn things on the fly is super important to us. And then we look for people that really uh, share, share the values that our, our company has. We really highly prize family and um, we look for people that really have a great deal of empathy and, and want to do make life better for the people around them. So those tend to really be um, things we look for 
we do still look to make sure, you know, if I'm hiring a software developer, you have to be able to code. You know, we still look at the technical requirements, but we found the cultural side of it is uh, almost more important than the technical side sometimes. And that seems to be universal. When I'm talking to clients, the cultural side is more difficult to find than the technical skills in nearly all cases and I love the fact that you're values driven um, about that love of learning and that natural curiosity as well it doesn't matter how old you are that constant be constantly learning and being excited about things and then obviously communicating and having those conversations and you mentioned at the beginning that you started being an entrepreneur when you were 17 so you sound like one of those guys who um, kind of the, the the square peg in the round hole kind of thing that you you wanted to do things differently, um, and I, I hear this a lot when I talk to entrepreneurs um, over the years that they've always had that mindset. But what advice would you give to young aspiring entrepreneurs with regards to how to start up, how to persevere, and how to succeed? Well. Um... The most important skill that you have is listening. And everybody has great ideas. Mm -hmm. Everybody has great ideas that, that if executed, might make a lot of money. But where those ideas intersect with the market is a lot harder to figure out. And the best way to figure that out is to ask questions and then really listen to that response. You know, prototype your product and show people and, and then really listen to the, the critique they give you. Everything bad someone says about your idea is an opportunity for you to learn how to make that product fit better. And that's so important. So many people go out and start a business or start a company. Uh, they have a brilliant idea. And every everyone is telling them that, you know, I, I like that idea, but I wouldn't pay for it. And, yeah. and it, you've got to hear that part about is somebody willing to pay for that? Otherwise you don't have a business and and there's other models for that. You know, if you need to start a charity, start a charity, but don't try to do business uh, with something that should be a charity. It won't work. Absolutely. Definitely. And get that user feedback because you do see a lot of people that have created almost like their baby and they're so proud of of what they've created, but they don't want to listen to feedback and they put the blinkers on or stick their head in the ground rather than, great, you don't like it. So that's an opportunity to change and make it better. Um, I'll tell you, one of the biggest uh, challenges that I have as an entrepreneur is keeping my ego in check and, and making sure that I'm not overwhelming people that might have feedback. Um, and so I, I really have to um, focus and, and concentrate on how do I, I be listening, a, lis- a good listener, and then how do I disarm whoever is going to be giving me feedback so they know that I'm not going to put up my defenses. I'm going to listen and take what they're saying to heart. Yeah. So coming from a place of psychological safety for them to give feedback and not be in awe of you. Um and feel comfortable to give you that feedback. Um, So your career spans over 30 years. Um, What have been the main highlights, would you say, Mike? Um, Boy, I sound old when you say it that way. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Wisdom. I like to call it wisdom. (laughs) Yeah. The, uh, The highlights of it for me have always been when great things have happened for the people that are part of the companies I've started. Um, I, you know, people having babies, um, people coming in and, and just having intractable problems with health care or their finances and actually being able to help them out with it. Um, it's, it's really cool when you're, you're able to realize that you're not just making a good living for yourself, but you've got, um, you know, families that are making a great living from what you've built together. Um, that seems to be a big thing uh, to me. And, and then um, occasionally something will come out of the blue. Um, 
you know, I'd been doing this for a long time and I'd never won any kind of award for a business I had started until this one. And we, we got a, a regional innovation of the year award. That was kind of a neat experience, but uh, really the best things are when things happen for the people that are a part of the business. It really just, um, it, it brings it all home on why we're doing what we do. That's beautiful. I mean, well done on the award, but I really like the fact that you kind of see your team as family and you're nurturing them and helping them grow and overcome any issues. And everybody has issues to overcome from time to time. So uh, they're not just there to make you money, so to speak. Um, so that's that's fantastic. And what would you say have been the main challenges um, over the, those years? Oh my, um, there's a, a, any, you know, ha, my hat is always off to any, any business person that's had to sign off on a payroll. It's hard. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you the number of times that, that, you know, we've had to face, you know, uh Oh, uh, we've got a big payroll coming and, and, uh, the bank account's a little light. What do we do? We've had to deal with that one, but I think really the biggest challenges I've ever dealt with have been, uh, when COVID hit this particular company, uh, we lost 85% of our revenue in a two month period. And we realized our product was not getting the traction. It was extra. It was something that you could easily cast aside. And um, we were very close to deciding to close this thing down uh, February, February, March of last year. And we decided not to. Um, and, that whole COVID thing, I, I don't think any of us had a page in our business plan about uh, what to do if there's a global pandemic. <laughs> um, no. and, and, and so we kind of faced that a choice with it. Can, do we take it as an opportunity or do we take it as an obstacle? And we chose to look at this as an opportunity to reinvent what we're doing. And we really radically changed the business and it, it ended up, um, being incredibly difficult um, because we had to change our staff. We had to let our sales and marketing team go and hire engineers instead. And um, it, it was a really big change and it was really hard to do under hard circumstances. So that's probably the toughest thing I faced. Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually, it made, as you were talking then, it made me think because last year, one of the, the words, buzzwords that everybody was using was pivot. So mm -hmm. pivot and reinventing. So is that how you came um, up with the name Pivot CX? Pivot yes. candidate. Yeah. It really, really is directly it means reinvent your candidate experience, you know, change yeah. it. And um, we, we knew just how slow and plotting most recruiting processes are. And we knew that that the thing that was missing was kind of the human touch and one of the things that human beings love is, is we don't like delays. You get put on hold on the phone. People don't like that. People have to wait in line. They don't like that. Um, so we knew that if we could get people to have a human to human experience faster, that it would be a radical transformation for, for most recruiting processes. And that is holding up. That premise has really, really held up well. And We've uh, worked with companies in a whole bunch of different industries, um, everything from warehousing and manufacturing to trucking. And uh, my favorite is technology because I'm a computer programmer by, you know, if you looked at my education and my trade, yes. uh, you know, I write software. Um, but you look at tech um, everywhere we've taken this, it has worked incredibly well. And and so, you know, it. it tells me that, that this candidate experience thing might might be a little bit important. Absolutely. Definitely. Excellent. So if you were to say one secret behind your success over those years, what would it be? Um, one day I was getting the oil changed in my car and Jack Welch, the CEO of GE at the time, was on the news doing an interview with an analyst who asked him what the most important advice he had for any business person would be. And um, I'll never forget the interviewer, the look on her face because she was so surprised with what he said. 
And it was so simple. It was know the facts and act on them. And um, I started looking at everything differently. Instead of going, what do I feel? I started going, what's going on? What, what's really happening here? And it changed how I made decisions. It changed. It changes how you look at at everything about business, and it helps you confront um, reality and and go, you know how do how do we take on? Should probably, uh, yeah. I need to look. I do look at the facts, but I do think about how people feel a lot, and it comes back to being in a a people business. But that's a, a really great tip which I'll take on board Um, and one last question Mike so if you could turn back the clock what advice would you give 21 year old Mike um wow that's a good one I probably would uh to to, if I if I had something to say to me at 21 it would be this focus and finish up school don't uh, get all distracted and party as much as you were. I was not a well-behaved young man. And um, so so the advice I would give me is pretty simple. It would be uh, stop partying and start studying. But life turned out okay. After that stint in the Navy, um, life's been great. Well, we must do another podcast on your uh, younger, naughtier years. They sound like tremendous fun. I'd quite like to have met 21-year-old Mike. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, um, thank you very much for sharing your insights, Mike. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Well, if you want to learn more about Pivot CX, the website is pivotcx.io. And uh, I'd love to get you know, feedback from anyone on our idea and what, what we're doing. Uh, there's a little video on that website that explains what we do. And I'd absolutely love to hear from people what they think of, of the whole idea. Absolutely. And I'll share that in the show notes. Um, and I love the idea. I think it's fantastic. Anything that can make the whole process quicker. I'm so impatient um, is, is fantastic. So thank you very much, Mike. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe, rate and review. If you're looking for career advice, your next career opportunity or to grow your tech team, then please call me, Nicholas Steele, on 0499 773 five four six or go to our website jjptalent.com.au the don't just survive thrive podcast is part of the spotlight series which includes the youtube channel spotlight on software development if you want more insights into the software industry particularly tech startups then subscribe to the spotlight on software development youtube channel thank you for listening until next time